Hey, is that everybody now? Yeah, it is. is. So we'll start. <clears throat> I'm going to start with a prayer. And uh, if people want to leave <laughs> on five, do we have for over five in case the discussion <laughs> rambled on? <clears throat> but don't feel embarrassed if you have to go. I won't burst into tears that you've suddenly left, you know, when it says so and so has left the meeting. So let us. Let us pray as we think about this course. Seeing and believing, O oh Lord, as we join together on this Lent course, we pray that you will help us to see more clearly and to believe more wholeheartedly in many aspects of our faith. May these paintings come alive to us as we share our thoughts and reactions today deepen our understanding and our love for you through these studies together. Amen. Amen. Right, well, thank you very much for being such a loyal, a loyal audience over all these months of on and off and on and off. And I can't tell you how lovely it is to see you all and to get this sort of level of interest and support. And, um, you know, you've given me a lot of heart and encouragement in doing that. So I want to start on Botticelli's painting, um, which is the mystic nativity. And I'll just say a little bit about Botticelli to start with, and then we'll look at the painting in some detail. Now, he was a very early Renaissance painter, um, 1444 to 1530. And it's thought he painted this about 1500 to 1501. Botticelli spent most of his life in Florence, and this is his only signed work, and it is in our own National Gallery, so some of you may have seen it there. The Nativity is a very popular subject for painters over hundreds and hundreds of years, and I wanted us to start by just suggesting, why do you think painters have chosen this as a topic and what are the traditional ingredients of a nativity painting? What would you expect to find? Mary and the baby. Mary and the baby, yes. A stable. A stable. Angels. Animals. Sorry, angels. Angels. Yes. Angels. Joseph. Animals. Yeah. Shepherds. 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 Magi. The Magi. Yeah. So we're very, we're very familiar with this as a theme in painting, aren't we, um, the nativity, and we know what to expect. Now, the biblical basis for the nativity, of course, um, is an interesting one. It's not as great as you might imagine. Um, the birth of Christ was foretold in the Old Testament, but our source is, of course, the Gospels. The Gospels of Mark and John have nothing about the nativity of Jesus at all. Matthew briefly mentions his birth, but most of the detail is in Luke. And here we find all the details of this nativity that we can see on this painting. And I've asked Corinna if she could just remind us of the biblical basis for this by reading to us from Luke chapter 2. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinus, Quirinus the governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them at the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, 
do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy and will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is Christ, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and laying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared and the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his saviour rests. Favour rests. Right. Thank you, Corinna. Well, that just reminds us of a very familiar story. And we know nothing else about Jesus Christ until he was taken to the temple um, uh, later. And then much later, of course, uh, in his um, when he was in his adolescence. So the biblical account of the nativity is really quite limited. But over centuries, it's been embroidered uh, lavishly in carols that we sing, in paintings that we look at, in music, in books, in sculpture, in films, in Christmas cards and in all the paraphernalia of our 21st century Christmas. And so in painting, the range of depiction of the nativity is enormous. Some paintings show the birth taking place in a cave, some in a shed, some in a stable, some in a house. It's an event which is enmeshed in tradition and legend. And we're going to look at these two very contrasting paintings which illustrate this. But if you think of the Christmas cards you get at Christmas, um, you'll realise the wide differences in the way in which Christmas is illustrated. So let's look at this painting now. Um, if we can zoom in at the top of the painting, you'll see some rather uh, <coughs> curious words written in, um, in Greek, a Greek inscription which um, Ben was able to read, obviously I'm not. Uh, but this Greek inscription refers to, uh, in inverted commas, the troubles in Italy. And Botticelli at the top of this painting is reminding people who are looking at it of the French invasion, which took place uh, in Naples in 1494. And it was coupled with very long strife and fighting in Florence. And Botticelli, we know, was very concerned about this upheaval, this war, about the catastrophes that were happening in his own lifetime. And Botticelli, for various reasons, believed that these cataclysmic events, political events, were in fact heralding the return of Christ as prophesied in the New Testament, the second coming. So he took a very apocalyptic view of these events. He thought this was the end time he was living through. Civilization was going to finish. I think it's interesting he thought this and I just wondered if you felt that people think like that today. Do people think oh it's never been like this we're in the end times uh, and do you think that covid has made people think a bit more like that i think you could be right because mm. what with covid and global warming um it's all slightly going downhill <laughs> yep. yes i think a lot of... sorry steve you want to tell the people in Texas about global warming at the moment. I don't think they agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think but people worry about it being, it's all going to come to an end, for example, in their lifetime? It does seem at the moment with the, the things like the volcanoes, climate yeah. change, the pandemic, uh, tsunamis, uh, all those sort of things sort of make you think of Armageddon. Yes, yes, yes. which is exactly mm. what Botticelli would have said, you see. Um, that's what he was thinking when he painted this painting. Um, so, you know, going through catastrophic periods of time is quite a, a common thing. And of course, many Christians today believe 
we're living in the end times. If you look, for example, at the book of Thessalonians in the New Testament or the book of Revelation, there is a great deal there about predicting um, the end of time. Now, I can understand Botticelli um, thinking this because he was, um, in my personal view, unhappy enough to live um, under the preaching of somebody called Savonarola, who you may well have heard of. He was a preacher who preached the most terrifying hellfire sermons and he would do massive meetings in squares in Florence with large crowds and he would tell them how they were going to hell, how they would be burnt up for their sins. And he was particularly angry about the rule of the Medicis in Florence. He believed the Medicis had led um, the Florentines and other Italians into disastrous ways of life. He believed that they had prompted moral decline and he challenged the lifestyle of many who were living very indulgent lives of luxury in Florence. And I think having read books about Savonarola, he was quite terrifying. Um, he demanded that people should return to follow Christ and Christian teaching. Now Botticelli was a follower of Savonarola and he lapped all this up. He really believed this firebrand monk had got the truth and was promising divine retribution for Florence. In fact, quite reasonably, Botticelli supported him. He, Savonarola even managed to negotiate a separation from the papacy for Florence, which, which was amazing. But he had a very sad ending because in 1498, he was horribly uh, executed for heresy. So Botticelli is painting these paintings through very turbulent times and this nativity painting that we're going to look at now in detail reflects this not only in the Greek inscription at the top but also in what is actually in the painting. It's a very interesting painting and unusual because of its iconography. Now if anyone Iconography is simply, in painting, the use of symbols to convey meaning. Um, and in the past, particularly in non-literate societies, people were very familiar with iconography and painting. They could look at a painting and they could in effect read it because they understood what was there. They understood what the symbols meant. Now to the modern eye, uh, a lot of these symbols are impenetrable. We wouldn't understand it at all. And one of the values of this little course that we're on is I think, I hope we'll learn to read paintings more accurately and learn a bit about what it means to read a painting. So I want us to focus on some of the symbols in this painting and the message that he wanted to get over. Now, all nativity paintings have a basic problem, and that is to try to show the divine and the human in the birth of Christ. And if you think about it, how do you convey divinity in a two dimensional painting? How do you convey humanity is, is it itself a challenge and even more the combination of the two. So painters over centuries have tried to do this. They've tackled this problem. How do you so, show God in man? So let's look at this painting and see how Botticelli tried to do this. If we look first at um, Mary and the baby Jesus. Now, when you look at them, there is something very, very odd about them. What do you think? They're, they're larger than the other. <laughs> yes, other right. Look at that baby. I mean... How old do you think that baby might be? Oh. It's more like a toddler, isn't it? Yeah. It looks as though he's been on a bottle or something by his stomach. I mean, it looks enormous. <laughs> and Mary, too, is very large. Look at her in mm. comparison to the animals behind. That's because she's supposed to be kneeling. And she's kneeling. Now, it is quite clear if you stood, if Mary was stood up, she couldn't get in this stable. 
So it is a very weird uh, aspect of the painting. However, to a medieval viewer, this is exactly what they would expect. Because in medieval painting, you, particularly religious painting, you made the really important object <coughs> big. And that in fact reflected their significance. So here Botticelli is saying to you and me, the most important part of this picture is the baby and his mother, which is not a surprise, but it might be a surprise given how he is portraying them. Now, this habit of making them bigger began to disappear in the Renaissance when of course, paintings became more realistic. People stopped building them, the significant figures up in this way. But this is a very interesting example of an early way of trying to show divinity. Try and make them bigger so that our eyes focus on them. Now, you will have looked at paintings which have tried to show divinity, but not by making the figures bigger. How do we identify the divine when we look at a painting? What sort they, of? They have a halo or a big round colour. Yeah. A halo. That's right. If you see a halo on somebody, you know it's supposed to be somebody holy or a saint or God or whatever. Who else? The light shining, not just the halo, but the light shining yes. behind them, radiating out. That, yes, light is very interesting. Yes. A lot of them, a lot of nativity paintings have light coming out from the um, stable. So light is another one. A halo. What else? Angels. Angels, yes. If an angelic presence is there, you think this must be, God must be somewhere. Hands clasped in prayer. Yes, yes. a posture, yes. Uh, in acts of reverence, that's right. What about her clothes? This is not a, well, it, it is a good example. How traditionally is Mary portrayed? <laughs> Always wrapped in blue. Always in blue. 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 Yes. She is traditionally portrayed in blue. And this is, does anybody know why that was? Because it was a royal colour. It was a hard come by colour. And it, it was, was very hard to come by colour. Yeah. Kept for special things. Yes. Or people. It, it was a very expensive colour. Very too. expensive. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. It was made from lapis lazuli originally and they ground it down. So Mary was deemed worthy to have this blue paint, which had cost uh, a lot of money to make. So sometimes with the colour, sometimes with Mary, you'll see paintings with a lot of gold embellishment, um, which clearly in real life she wouldn't have had. But again, that's all part of making her look special. Uh, lots of lavish embroidery, very sumptuous fabrics of her clothing. Sometimes too around Mary, there are certain flowers. When have you seen, what flowers mm. have you seen around Mary sometimes? Yes, lilies. Lilies, lilies. lilies very commonly lilies, mm -hmm. which symbolize purity. Yeah. Roses. Roses, yes. Carnations, do you remember the Lady of the Pinks? Oh yes. yes. Loyalty and faithfulness, I think. The Madonna of the Pinks rather. That was Raphael. Um, there's one other thing which is interesting that we'll look out for later, but not in this painting, you don't see it. Um, if, if any of you can think back to when you've looked at paintings of the Annunciation, when Mary is told or asked if she will be the mother of the Son of God, some of those paintings, particularly medieval and Renaissance paintings, there's a big gap between Mary who's often portrayed as she was, a young girl kneeling down or sitting down, and the angel, Gabriel, who has come with this message. There's often a lot of space between the angel and between Mary. And this is very interesting in religious paintings. Space is also an indicator of the divine. So if you see a big space between two figures and it's a religious painting. It may be the painters trying to suggest to you that God was there in that situation. You see it particularly 
in Annunciation paintings, if you look back, uh, there's, there's quite, most of them are really significant space between Mary and the angel. So we'll now look at some more detail of this painting. If we go to the top of the painting, um, <clears throat> and here is a golden dome. This may remind you a little bit of another very famous painting by Botticelli. Can anybody recall that? Oh, I read that they were in the colour of the Three Graces. Uh, yeah, that is true. Yes. I wasn't thinking of If you think of, yes, well, if you think of the birth of Venus, you know, the, the famous oh. painting with the, the ladies in the shell oh, yes, yes. Yes. moving round. A lot of people think this motif was one that he used several times. And right. there, there's something about it here. Now, this this is a golden dome that you can see. And this is a dome which is mentioned in Revelation chapter 21. And it's supposed to be reminding us, here we're back to the apocalypse again, it's supposed to be reminding us of the new heaven, which will come in the future. And it suggests the presence of God in this new heaven with this golden light of the dome. Um, and of course, in the new heaven, they often do mention angels, light and jewels. And here we've got angels uh, whizzing round, holding some significant things. So one of the things there, well, tell me, the, tell me the things you can see they're holding. Ribbons. 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 Branches. And branches, yes. Crowns. Crowns the branches, are um, yeah. The branches are olive branches. Yeah. And they're meant to resemble peace. So in reading that, the, they're bringing peace. This is, an, uh, he is thinking, you know, in the new heaven and the new earth, there will be peace. Um, there are also, can you see the crown? The crown's yeah. hanging off. Yes. Strange, floating what sometimes in midair. Yeah. The crowns remind you, should be reminding us, of Christ returning as king. So here Botticelli is saying, Christ will return and he'll come back as king and he'll come back in peace. The circle which the um, formed by the angels, again in medieval thinking, circles always suggested completeness and harmony. So again, we've now got peace, harmony, kingship. Um, I can't find, I've looked in several books to see about the ribbons. Uh, nobody mentions the ribbons as being very symbolic and I just wonder here if they are just decorative but I don't know if anybody's got any ideas. I, I thought them. something was supposed to be written on them. Yes I mean there are ones that look as though they've got writing on. Yes. But Maybe they must be. Does it tie everything together? Yeah. What, what size is, was the original painting? Oh I haven't got that here. Um, <laughs> just a minute. <laughs> I think it's about a hundred centimeters by uh, it's seventy-five. Quite big. I thought I'd got it on the bottom there. <coughs> it's not that large, is it? It's not massive, no. It's got a lot in into a small space, then. It yeah. certainly has. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Maybe if you make them float in air, it's easier. I don't. Yeah. Yeah. I do wonder whether the ribbons are as because when you look at crucifixion paintings and you have Jesus sort of in loincloths. Yes. Often they go ridiculously far and they look like ribbons as though sort of, I can't think of a metaphor, but sort of, you know, that very small laundry day of all he could put on on the crucifix. Yeah. But then there's that great billowing shape and it sort of feels a little bit like that motif, of the ribbons billowing away from the cross. Maybe. If we move down a bit now onto the roof of the manger, the stable. Um, these curious people here on the roof. Again, they're carrying olive branches. You just see feet at the top there, um, and they've got um, they've got a. What are they holding? Do you think? A book. A book. A book. Uh, what do you think it is? Is it the Torah? Uh, no, funny enough, it's probably not the Torah. 
Probably a, a think thing. about his um think about the fact he's thinking in terms of like the book of revelation he's thinking of the end of the world oh, uh, what might this book be it's some um, sort of where people's names would be placed that are going to be yeah. that's right vivian it, it is the book a book of judgment oh. he's actually <coughs> taking this from revelation chapter 20 where it talks about people's names being written in the lamb's book of life so here again is reminding people of the judgment to come, but this is with the nativity underneath it. And I, I want us to think about the two things put together. Uh -huh. Quite interesting, um, not odd ideas you would often link up in that sense. If we go a bit further down, um, we'll see the stable is extraordinary, really. There appear to be two slabs of white rock. Hmm. Why? Does it signify the tomb? Yes, I think it does, Vivian. Yes. yes. Yeah. I think the slabs of rock are the tomb. So that's a prophetic element to this painting. It is reminding us of the coming death of Christ, of this baby. I also thought at the back, I only thought this today as I was looking at it here. If you look through beyond Mary's blue robe, it's almost like a church windows, isn't it? Yes. Where the, the light is coming from the back. You'd almost think that was glass. I mean, it isn't. It's just the trees with the light. Trees, yes. coming through. Or the ascension. Mm. Or the ascension. Yes, that's right. Mm. So Going to the light. So who are those figures, Margaret, on the top? We've just, those angels. They're just, yeah. the, 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 the chap with the book. Yeah, the ones with the book, yeah. Oh, okay. Just talked about them. Yeah, no, I just wondered if, if they were identified in any way. Oh no, no, no! They're just angels, okay, holding the Lamb's book of uh, the, the book of life. Right? Yeah. No, I don't. I don't think they. I've not seen anywhere that suggested they had names. I yeah. thought they were faith, hope, and charity. They represent faith, hope, and yes. charity. Some have said, yeah, the three, yeah. three graces they represented faith, hope, and charity. Yeah, right. that's what I those are the colours of both yes, the children. white, the pink, mm. and the green. Yeah, mm. makes sense. Mm. Well, okay. Going back to the ribbons on the one at the top under the gold dome, would they be to bind us together, Lord? Um, well, I don't know. Do they look as though they're binding? Um, it might be suggestive of that, I suppose. I mean, you could. I, I thought they might be uh, of the grave clothes because he was wrapped in uh, grave clothes, wasn't he? Oh, I see. Mm. Yes. You might also start thinking they were swaddling clothes. Yeah, mm -hmm. carry on like this, but I oh, I'm not so it. <laughs> there are interesting things to think about. This is what is, you know, thinking about these paintings, you in time see a lot more in them, don't you? Yes. Then on the, on the, if we look at what we can see, you can see the, um, on the left, as you look at the painting of the Magi, who look as though they've got hair that's covered in olive branches really uh -huh. um, and on the right are the shepherds I, again rather conventionally but both of the groups are different because if you look at the shepherds where we are at the moment you can see curiously an angel is leaning over the shepherd yeah. mm -hmm. now in the um, reading that Corinna did for us you know we heard about the angels went to, to the shepherds and told them to go to Bethlehem and here we've got this angel leaving over the shepherd and there has been lots of questions in books about what they're actually doing is it trying to show that humans and angels are united in love at this event or is it showing they'll be united in the new kingdom in the future um it's very difficult to know what Botticelli was suggesting here. And the same is true of the Magi. They have angels near them as well. And it's unusual in this painting. You see, there's an angel pointing out. Now, that angel, to me, looks more as if she's telling them who he is, who the baby yeah. is. She's yes. Hand out. The other you know? one's doing the same. Yeah. They seem to be directing operations. Yeah. Yes, they do. They've, she's got a hand out and they've also got these twigs with these ribbons on again yeah. with writing yeah. 
mm. on it. Mm. So it's quite a intriguing painting in that sense. If we move down then, um, <laughs> we go to the bottom of the painting. It's even more surprising in a way. Um, because here we've got couples embracing, and they appear to be angels and humans, each pair. Uh, and it is suggested this was merely to reflect that they will be united in the new kingdom. Angels and humans will be embracing. Again, a thought that probably wouldn't immediately come to us. I think in the modern world, this is quite a medieval idea of mm -hmm. angels giving us a big hug, especially perhaps COVID times. We don't think much about <laughs> hugs anyway. <but laughs> there they are. Is it, is it, is it, life then, ever, is it life everlasting? Life everlasting, yeah. yeah. And very amusingly, I think he must have had a sense of humour. If you look in the rocks behind yes. these, yes, you know, yeah. Well, are these hilarious little, little look at this little chap? Yes, I was trying yes. to work that out. Yes. Yes. A... They're little devils. And little devils. Yes. yes. Ah. Oh, beast, they... uh, from beast, bestiality, isn't it? It's yes. From the, uh, and the what beast, they do... Bestiality. Yes, yeah. and this one up here. Yes, and the yes, other one. That, that, that one down there. Is very, I think, why do you think he's put them in? What is he suggesting? Is he getting rid of evil? Getting yeah. rid of, yes, because they look yes. as if they're getting rid of evil. They're being speared. Mm. They're running away, trying to hide from this, new, in this new kingdom, trying to hide from God in the cracks of the rocks. In other <laughs> words, it is, they're running for cover. And mm. this is when he's, Botticelli is thinking to himself, there will be a time when evil people Will and Satan and his little helpers, they'll be defeated. And this defeat of evil starts with the birth of Christ. And hence he put it in the picture as being this is where, where the birth of this baby will lead. It will lead to the end of evil. This is what he was thinking when he painted it. So I want us to just reflect on this and then look at the second painting, um, which is much less detailed than this. You can see why it's called the mystic nativity today, because it is saturated with symbolism, with suggestions, ideas about the importance and the birth of Jesus Christ. Normally, Botticelli paints on wood, but this painting is on canvas. And it's thought that might be because he was either going to use it for his own personal devotions and therefore wanted to be able to roll it up so he could carry it with him when he travelled. Or he was going to give it to friends so they could use it for their own personal devotions. Um, so it takes us well beyond the birth of Christ into a vision of the future, into a new world or the end of this world and the next. And the birth and death of Christ are very closely linked. Um, if you think about our great festivals of Christmas and Easter, um, in society generally, of course, um, they've almost, uh, the religious element of Christmas often is hard to see. But there is much more enthusiasm about Christmas um, probably than there is about Easter. I wondered if you felt you engaged with one of them more than the other, or whether they were rather similar in your own mind, Christmas and Easter. I think as you get older, your perception of Easter changes from when you were a younger. Yeah. Why do you think that is, Corinna? Because Easter becomes more significant, mm. more significant, but mm -hmm. Easter then yeah. becomes a bit more significant in the Christian faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's our right. most, most holiest festival, isn't it? Yeah, much less commercialised in Christmas too. Yeah. It's much less commercialised. Yeah, it's just, just commercialised with Easter eggs and Easter bunnies, isn't it? It's just yeah, sort of it is. marketed uh, I, 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 differently. Um, the um, Margaret, the uh, ribbons are, are scrolls with uh, peace on earth and goodwill. To oh, all right, written on them. Like banners. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Yeah. All right, thank you. Banners. Banners. That's great, thank you. 
I anybody think, else? I think the thing about Easter um, is that it's it has a long run up, all a uh, lots of very significant days, and it's an incredibly important. Yeah, uh, for me, it's much more significant than Christmas. Mm. Yeah, um, because of Good Friday, Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, the whole of Holy Week, really. Um, and then you end up with a sort of culmination of Easter Day and all the joy of Easter, and it's highly significant, I think. Mm. Don't I you think, think also, can I just say? Yeah. I yeah. think also that it's as you get older, you become nearer to death, mm -hmm. and you're thinking about the sacrifice he made for us and, ha and his promise mm. yeah. of the life to come. Yeah, I'm sure that's right, Sue. Yeah. Yeah. I think I feel more akin to Easter now than I do to Christmas, certainly. Mm. So, but I think that the, one of the things we often forget at Christmas, or is never not clearly shown, <laughs> is the fact that Christmas and Easter, and that's why I started off at this point, are very closely linked, yeah. because the birth of Christ is imbued with his death. Yeah. You know, this is the beginning of a, of a journey for him, mm. of um, redemption and redemption for us. So Botticelli lived in dangerous and uncertain times, and he was looking positively forward to the kingdom of God on earth. He was looking for something positive. And um, maybe it's something we need to think more about when people have been depressed during this pandemic. I want us now to, to move on to a completely different sort of painting for the last few minutes. And this is a Chinese painting of the Nativity. And um, when you look at this, it, it is a modern painting and it is a dramatic difference from what we've been looking at. Um, all our paint, most of the paintings on this little Lenten series will be European, but this is different because it is Asian, it's Chinese. He's an artist now, Heike, who lives in America, um, his work's been compared to Chagall and Picasso and Matisse, but he only paints Christian paintings. Mm -hmm. He doesn't paint any other subject. At the moment, he's been painting the book of the Psalms, and he's also doing illustrations of the entire Bible. It sounds like an, an amazing project to me. He was born in, I wanted to say something about him because it's interesting. He was born in 1951. And he was brought up as a small boy during the Cultural Revolution in China. And as a teenager, the Cultural Revolution with Mao was in full swing. His father was a university teacher. He lost his job because the university was shut down by the regime. And to help feed the family, Heike was sent to work in fields. But in fact, he wasn't very strong and he became ill. And then he had a brilliant idea. Mao insisted that um, all the villages in China should have a great big picture of Mao in the village so that people could venerate him. And he got this great idea. He could go around and paint these pictures in villages for the villages, on walls of people's houses, that sort of thing. So in all the villages round about, he went around painting pictures of Mao. And he earned his living and helped his family survive through painting these murals over several years. But at the same time in the evening, he managed to study art. And he learned to paint European art from prints. So for example, he, he says in his book that uh, by day I painted Mao, by night I painted Raphael's Madonnas. So he would go back and then start and work through the body of European art. Now, China. Sorry? I was going to say, presumably Christianity wouldn't be allowed in China. He was, yeah, and he was not a Christian at all. And he says this, and this is partly why I'm telling you this. Um, China was in turmoil. There was a lot of rioting. And he says this, that he used to return home through crowds rioting on the streets. And he would sit down and look at, for example, he says one of Raphael's Madonnas and the peace that he saw in her eyes touched him. And that was the start of his long journey to Christian faith. 
was through a painting, through a mm. classical painting. A decade later, the revolution ended. He went to study in Germany. He did a PhD in art, the first Chinese person to do a PhD in medieval art in post-revolutionary China. He worked in a university in China for a time and then in the end went to live in the States. And um, <clears throat> he still goes back to China, partly because they, some of the paintings are produced in quite a complicated way, which we haven't got time to go into, but they do involve silk printing. And he still goes back to the very, very long traditions of silk screen printing in China. Mm. And his paintings are reproduced uh, as part of the process there. So he has um, come to faith through painting and through looking at painting. And he was asked once, why does he still return to China? And he said that in China, um, you either are a Christian because your family was and they taught you, um, or through your own personal journey and his was through art. And he still feels that he wants to go back and take his art back into China as well as Europe. And he's trying to bridge the gap between Eastern and Western art, both in his techniques of painting and in his portrayal. So when we look at this one, it is astonishing in some ways. Mm. Uh, and I think you need to adjust your eyes a bit. Um, they're very vibrant in color and stylistically extraordinary really. Um, I think they're quite startling. And if we look at this one, uh, Nativity Painting, compare it with what we've just been looking at, what would you find startling about this painting? Just the colour of the it just sticks out, doesn't it? So Sorry? Very vibrant. Very vibrant, it is. Well, but Mary's in, Mary's in pink. Yeah. Yes. In pink. Yes. And there's no joke. The faces are all the, the faces are all they're really all away from Jesus. Yeah. yeah. Almost looks like a stained glass window. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah. Well, that's very interesting, oh. Vivian, because uh one of the critics of his work says he thinks that almost every painting he's done would be superb in stained glass. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and I think that's probably right. I think they're almost better. They might even be more powerful as stained glass than they are as paintings. Yeah. And why is baby Jesus holding a fruit of some sort? Ah, yes. well, yes. Apple. Yeah, apple. Fruit is he holding? What is he holding? An apple. apple. An apple. And why is that so significant here? Adam, Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. Yeah. Sorry? Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. So here we've got the great link between the birth and death of Christ. Here we've got a baby, baby Jesus holding an apple. In other words, what Hickey is saying to us, this should take you right back to the story of Genesis chapter one and, and two and the Garden of Eden. And it all started with symbolically with the apple uh, and now here you've got your way out of the apple as it were the impact of the apple because here is the saviour born and he is holding the apple as the symbol of the change he is going to bring with go back to Botticelli the new kingdom so the apple is uh, really significant bit of this painting. What is interesting is that um, babies holding apples in nativity paintings were quite common in very early medieval paintings. I can't say I've consciously seen one. I don't know if any of you have. This no. was the first one I'd seen and I was startled by it. But I gather in medieval paintings, um, Jesus is often holding an apple as a baby. Huh. Yeah, it's I like it. I really like it as a as a, yeah. a work of art. I do. I, I think, think it's lovely. lovely. Yes. Yeah. And then you've got the other ingredients of a nativity painting, but done in yeah. his own way. So yeah. what else there is so familiar to us? The angel floating above. The angel, yes. Yeah. The star. With a green face. Mary. 
the shepherds. Mary, cuddle, Mary cuddling the baby. You don't see that normally. No. Mm. And the baby looks as though he's in a bit of, my mother would have called it ticking. You know, that's <laughs> type material we used to have on mattresses. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then you've got Joseph at the, behind her. Yeah. With the light. I think the foot is very significant too, because yes. lots of things in the age, feet are very, very important. The feet are very important, yes. But he's got the star and the donkey and the... The star and the donkey, the animals. The, the, yeah. the manger. Yeah. And the sheep. The sheep. Yeah. The sheep. It's all there. Yeah, it's all there. I mean, the sheep around the front here are, are lovely, aren't they? They're almost yes. sort of gambling, you know? I think it's beautiful. It's marvellous. Absolutely. So we have got time just to look at another one uh, um, of his. Can we move on to the next one, Ben? Here we are. Oh, oh no! Oh, 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 Leaving the Garden of Eden. Ah, um, <laughs> I've got the Supper to Mayors. Oh, the sorry. Uh, I was going to do the Mayors later. Um, we were going to do a Mayors when we did. Have we got another one or not? Otherwise, we'll talk about this. Uh, Ruth and Naomi? Yeah, that's okay. Let's do Ruth and Naomi. Yeah. Right, this is totally, this is another one of his. This is a very interesting, uh, very lyrical painting, I think. Um, this is his version of Ruth and Naomi. It takes now, a while for you to work out where yes. they are. Yeah. Well, I can it's see it's a hug. Recognize it's a hug, hand. embracing. Yeah. Yes. If you remember in the story, mm -hmm. um, she Ruth chooses to remain with Naomi, her mother-in-law, when yeah. she could have gone back to her own people. Mm -hmm. And she promises to her she will never leave her. And indeed, she doesn't. And um, they, they go back to Naomi's home country, where she picks, and I assume this is the three little bits of wheat there in the yeah. basket. Oh, she right. Boaz, who she eventually marries in a wheat field. So that's the oh, that's suggestion of that. Yeah. Very good, again, I do like it. Very abstract. Yes, very abstract, much more abstract. Yeah. In yeah. fact, you I, need... I think it's one of the most, I've, I've got a book with about 50 and I think this is probably one of the most abstract ones I've seen. Is she pregnant there? Sorry? Is she pregnant there? No, nobody's pregnant that I know she of. She looks pregnant to me. No. <laughs> you mean the hand coming down? Hand on the hand. stomach. On yeah. Tummy. yeah. And the hardest move. It's a story yeah. that she gets the land back because she gets pregnant, doesn't she? Yeah, she doesn't uh, get pregnant uh, until she marries Boa. Yeah, that's right. But that's what it, she gives it all Is back. that a, a dying son in the background? Or a hardest yes. move. That's the son, yeah. And I think the green is the fields where they worked, where she worked. Mm. If you took away the uh, the basket, you wouldn't realise it, what it was, would you? No, I don't think actually uh, it is particularly. I don't. I don't think you'd guess anyway, even with oh, the basket. It's the other hand. I think it's quite a. When we look at some of his others, um, they're much more like the nativity. You know immediately what the event was. It's, yes, you have to work a bit harder to work out what this one is. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you can see why people compare him to people like Picasso and yeah. mm -hmm. where um, it's much more of a sort of symbolic sort of painting. The collage about but, um, we will look at a, we will look at um, the other one Ben showed us, the road to Emmaus, because later on we're going to look at Caravaggio. Um, also painting Emmaus, and we're going to look at this one that he did on Emmaus too. Um, that's another one of the road to Emmaus, actually, um, which we're not going to look at, so we can look at that briefly. And you can see there, they're on literally on the road, a red road with palm trees, lilies again, and quite. I, I don't know how one imagines this, but I mean, it's, it's an interesting way he's imagined it. I like his style, I really do. Yeah. yeah. I, someone I haven't heard of before. No. Um, oh, right. But I should definitely be looking at him again. Yes, do. Well, there's quite a lot of his paintings on the internet. Mm. Yeah. 
Yeah, very nice. I like the lilies. I'd say I like them. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. See, it almost looks as though it's oh, a pastel. Lilies. Sorry, Glennis. I said to me, it almost looks as if it's pastel. Yes. Rather than paint. No, it is paint. It is yes. paint. I couldn't see the lilies. Yeah. The bottom. Oh, were you wanting the oh, no, I've, got, as well. I've got everybody's faces on the bottom. That's why I can't see the lilies. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> were you wanting the supper at Emmaus as well, Margaret? Yes. Well, we can. Yeah, we're going to look. Well, we're going to look at this when we look at the Caravaggio. Super. So I'll probably will leave that. Yeah, because it's interesting to see it with the Caravaggio. Yeah. But the thing about his paintings, they do challenge us visually, don't they? They make mm -hmm. us look differently at a familiar topic, like the nativity. Mm -hmm. They make us think again about it, and I think that's a very good thing. It's yeah. funny, when I first looked at the um, a print of this, it almost looked Mayan to me, rather than Chinese. Oh, right. The sort of South American ancient yeah. art. Yeah, yeah. Yes. It's with the, the sort of the squarish um, faces. Yeah, look, I just think they're lovely. Look, yes. as techy or fairy. Yes, yeah. indeed. Yeah. So then, funny, uh, funny to see an Oriental Jesus, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> with a small tuft of hair. Oh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Little top knot. <laughs> oh dear. I think the flower above Mary, um, against the dark blue sky, is that uh, <laughs> A bit yeah. like a halo. It's a star. I, I don't know. I mean, the, the, right. okay. right. the grey thing. Yeah. 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 I don't know what that grey thing no. is. It's his I idea of a halo. I think that's all it oh, can no. be. But then Jesus hasn't got one. No. <laughs> and she's got this sort of pink around the back of her head, which I imagine is her a veil uh, oh, for a headgear isn't it yeah. Mm. yeah and it looks as though that is sort of stuck on or don't know what yeah. it is really but it's so a is, very... it a, <coughs> is it a crossing of beliefs with a baby with a shaved head because in lots of religions they do shave the head of the baby at birth don't they they do yeah i was horrified yeah. when my granddaughter was both of them had their heads head shaved did they <laughs> Well, yes, they're, they're Thai, half Thai, right. um, but they push off doing it until after we've been to see them. <laughs> because I, it, but it's not a religious thing, though. It just oh. they, they believe that the it grows the hair stronger. Oh, right. That's so I understand. That's a cultural. Yeah. It's just a Muslim yeah. thing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Although, if they go into retreat and into the monastery for a, a month, or um, as my daughter and my daughter in law did a few months ago they can a, a lot of them do shave their hair then she didn't um but it's not it's not obligatory but a lot of the people do so yeah, yeah it's just a different way mm. Mm. what is that a sign of penance is it it is really yes um it may well be and it's just a i don't know maybe help you concentrate on your prayers and meditation rather than fiddling with your hair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your bad head. I'm looking at the, the, um, the lamp that um, is being carried there. It's almost like a, well, it's a symbol for Jesus being the light of the world and and also the star as a way because obviously the star was what led the, um, the Magi there but it's also the guiding light that Jesus yeah. you know, he is the guiding light. Um, yeah. Well, just it's just my own thought on it, really. Very good. Mm. I like it. The the, the angel the angel is very much like the one in the uh, Köln Cathedral, isn't it? Floating in the yes, big wooden. It is. It's mm. very similar, isn't it? Yeah. Sort of design. Yes. Because yeah. she floats above everybody, or he. Over there. Yes. Nicely done. Mm. Lovely. So it's very contrasting with the first one isn't it very oh very much so much less iconography here really yeah much less detail and if you think back to the other one in a way this one is much more um dramatically has a lot more impact in some ways hasn't it yes yeah. 
Because yeah. it's sort of pared down. Mm. Mm. The so geometric... much of its time. Mm. Yeah. The ge geometric design in this, yes. but the other picture, you suddenly see the very harsh zigzag of the path in the middle. Yeah. Which I thought was quite significant too, between the top and the bottom. And then you've yes. got the straight lines in yes. this as well. So just the two pictures, but there are some straight lines in both pictures. Yes. And this idea in this picture with these lines, quite a few of his paintings have these lines, but not all. So there is meaning in the lines. I mean, one of the critics feels in this one, the lines are particularly um, strong because it's showing that Christ came. He also brought a lot of conflict in the world. You know, his his life was a presented people with choices and difficult decisions and challenges and that this painting reflects this because it looks unharmonious hmm. you know the lines I mean you just have to think about it in what you think yourself you know but some people see the lines as being suggestive of controversy division um challenge that sort of thing hmm. Hmm. They're more clever. They're much more clever than I am. I just look at it and think it reminds me of stained glass windows. Yeah, I think. Yes. I, I mean, I think the, the comment about stained glass windows. I'm sure when we look at the other paintings, and if you look on the internet, um, all of them will be great in a window, actually. Yes, because mm. they're fantastic colours. Yeah. Mm. I don't think he knows the meaning of the word pastel, I've decided. There are no <laughs> pastel colours at all. I mean, they're all these full on fibre colours. Colors. Yeah, they're all primary colours, that's right. Very eye catching. They are very. So I think really what I, looking at these two, I thought in terms of the nativity, it is interesting for us to get a more diverse perspective on it, you know, to move forward into areas we haven't perhaps thought of before, certainly visually, and um, to think about the nativity as a as the start of a story which leads very directly to the death of Christ. And, you know, through Lent, we now move next week on to um, the picture of the baptism of Christ. And that's much more where you would expect to be in a Lent course probably, than starting with a nativity. But I think the nativity is interesting because seeing Jesus with the apple, I just felt this was not to be missed, really. Oh, definitely. And it symbolises the link between the two events. Very good. Excellent. Yeah. Good. Right, we'll close with a prayer as we've got time. And then, um, oh, we've been very good with the time, Ben. It's excellent. So, Lord, we thank you for this time of learning and reflection together. We thank you that we can enjoy these paintings together. Help us to remember, reflect and grow in our faith in the days to come through this Lent. Amen. 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 So, thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. You don't have to dash off. You. you know, do say anything. You don't have to thank you. Thank People you. may have other things they want to say. I don't know. I, I was interested in Joseph's position in the first one because he looked very sad where he's crouched down. In the Botticelli. Yes, yes. When, when you look it at is a different and unusual view of him. It is. It just sort of. I mean, I wonder if in, the, in there, Joseph, I think it was interesting. He looks very old. He did have a very, very. I, I always feel Joseph is very neglected. You know, he had this enormous problem of what to do about this girl who had got pregnant. And yes. then he is told to, to keep her. But he's got this burden. They then had to escape. You know, so he must have felt he got the weight of looking after them. Yes. On yeah. On his shoulders. Yes. I mean, do you think that's right, Ben? Mm. Mm. No, I think so. It's a... Yeah. It's always that fascinating untold narrative that, yeah. uh, again, I think culture has sort of put more upon it than um, scripture has. But no, I think Fiona's right. It's, it's a very a barefooted uh, Joseph there, along with the barefooted shepherds. It's certainly sort of 
puts us where Joseph is in the picture. Yeah, he, he looks very old though, you know. He does, I thought that. I mean, he was older than her, wasn't he? Mm. A lot older. Yeah. I, my first set eyes on it, any young child who saw that would be frightened to death. Yeah. They were there to frighten you, weren't they? Uh, and, you know, the fear of those devils taking you to damnation. <laughs> Found that little hole there. Yes. <laughs> what? Set the what? terrier on him. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> One other thing I've spotted is, you know, we were talking about the ribbons at the top with the angels. <coughs> the angel at the bottom has got a ribbon with him. Yeah. 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 Uh, I, I, was ask, I was going to ask you, Margaret, I mean, what would, this is obviously speaking in um, authorial language, because a lot of people probably don't read and write, but what was the reality of people actually getting to see this painting, you know, the ordinary everyday person in that time? Um, well, because it was rolled up and, and prepared probably for private devotion, it was probably not hung, they think. I mean, most of his paintings were for churches, as they would have been, and they were on wood and they'd been on often altar parts of altar pieces or part of a worshipping um, building. This one, as I say, there is this uncertainty because it's quite rare being on canvas. Yeah. I mean, it is obviously in a frame now, but uh, the thought is that it, you won't, they usually only painted on canvas if they wanted to, uh, because they saw it as more fragile. If they wanted to travel with the painting, or it, uh, people wanted to take the paintings with them on journeys. And obviously it was much easier if you could roll it up, which is what you could with this. So I don't know that it would have been a lot of public mm -hmm. view of this one in medieval times, certainly. Yeah. Because I've read somewhere that it, it disappeared for about over yeah. 200 years. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and it's now the National Gallery. It's, yeah. I thought that um, going back to the, the age of um, Joseph, I thought that the depiction of Mary was quite old in some ways. You, you don't see so many, you see very fresh faced girls really normally, don't yes. you? You think she looks old, do you, Sue? Yes. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't think she looked particularly old, just looked particularly good. Yeah. Nice. Not very old, but older than you would expect. Yeah. Because yeah. she was probably only in her teens, wasn't she? Yeah. Yes. Well, well, if you look at Joseph, he's an old devil. He's got a bold head. <laughs> yes, he's bald. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes, he's a lot older. Yeah. And the poor shepherd seems to be um, bereft of trousers. <laughs> yes. 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 Yeah. Just got. Yeah. Leggings on. Leggings on or something. Yeah. 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 Right. Well, I shall go. And me too. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark.